Now, I'm still looking at hypocrisy, uh, some history of the concept, um, and I looked at in the previous video, check it out if you haven't, on uh, the origins of it in, in ancient Greece, uh, looking at it from its origins in, in the theater and how it seemed to have been neutral. Um, and then gradually, of course, uh, because people didn't like actors and thought they were dissemblers and things like that and, and, and uh, uh, had very negative views, uh, it seems that the concept acquired sort of this negative connotation. All right, here let's look at the Bible. And of course, that's full of a lot of stuff about morality, and it's not surprising that it's going to have something to say about hypocrisy. Um, now, the, well, probably the most famous stuff uh, about hypocrisy it probably is uh, the is is in the New Testament, um, or well known perhaps in the general public might be in the New Testament, maybe not. But uh, certainly Jesus is encountered with the Pharisees, right, and calling them hypocrites and warning the rest of us not to be hypocrites. But that's not totally original. That uh, you know you can find a lot of this stuff about hypocrisy in the Old Testament, maybe not quite as fleshed out, but hey, it came first, and uh, writers later on would pick up on these ideas and develop them further and. And, uh, uh, and see where they go. But let's have a look briefly at the Old Testament in this video, and then we'll go to the New Testament in the next video. So in 2 Samuel uh, 12, 1 to 9, you can have a look at that. That's a really interesting little parable. Um, it's a discussion of King David's judgment. And um, basically, King David is, uh, well, he's a king, so he's throwing his weight around. Um, and... Um, God's not happy about this because he's not ruling in a proper way, in a decent way. He's not respecting uh, the population. And basically, he, he's arguably kind of stealing from them. And he steals all kind of stuff, not just property, but uh, uh, he will steal, uh, you know, uh, in this case, basically, he tries to steal some uh, a wife. So he's, he's looking at, he takes people. So this is pretty bad stuff. Um, so in King David, as he... Uh, he finds he's very attracted to uh, Bathsheba, who is the wife of this guy, Uriah. And anyways, to make a long story short, or a long parable short, um, he, uh, he, he arranges for Uriah to be more or less killed on the battlefield. So he kind of arranges through this way to get Uriah out of the way and, and without himself looking bad, right? So he's trying to hide how he did it, but he gets Uriah out of the way so that he can have Bathsheba to himself. Um, and um, that's, you know, that's going to make God pretty mad, right? He's like, no, 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 you don't do stuff like that. And uh, so what he does, what God does, is he sends in a prophet, a guy named Nathan. So Nathan comes in, and he's going to teach King David a, a little lesson, and he tells King David uh, a little story, a parable, right? So I think the whole thing is kind of a parable, but there's a parable within a parable, or however you want to read it. Definitely Nathan tells this little story, uh, more or less, of a rich man and a poor man, and the rich man has, uh, you know, lots of animals, a big flock, and the poor man basically has one, uh, one, uh, uh, one, one sheep, that's it. And um, he kind of, this poor man, he has only this one sheep and he's really attached to it. Like, it's almost like his pet. It sounds like it's his, like his dog, right? He takes it in and, and it's just a baby and he raises it and he's, you know, basically it sleeps uh, with the family and all that. Like, kind of like a dog, you know, sleeping at the end of your bed. So is this little, little sheep and, uh, and he adores this little thing. And then one day the rich man is visited and has to... Um, visited by this this traveler and he's and he and he has to make up a feast for this traveler and instead of using one of his own flock he takes the poor guy's only only animal and he slaughters that for the feast okay so that's in the parable and uh nathan tells this to king david and king david says oh that's an outrage you know he gets all this is terrible you're taking from people they're not in my kingdom do you do that says uh uh, uh, and, and this is going to, you know, and then King David gets into sort of the legal, well, you know, by the law, you're not supposed to do that. And the punishment will be, you know, something you have to pay back fourfold or sevenfold, depending on whichever translation of the Bible uh, you want to uh, want to use. I, I, I think in the original, it's like it's sevenfold or something, but fourfold, whatever. He's going to have to pay back more than he actually took to atone for this crime. Um, and... Uh, uh, you know, and then finally, 
Nathan goes, well, surprise, this is all just a parable, and you're the guy who's doing this kind of stuff. You're taking, and uh, you've taken a wife, and you're, you're, you know, you're throwing your weight around, and you're kind of being, you know, double standard. So this raises another issue. Is the hypocrite someone who, uh, maybe not always a dissembler, but someone who employs double standards, right? So being a hypocrite is, oh, sure. Uh, the, the, those standards apply to that guy, that rich guy over there, but King David, they don't apply to you. And you're going to use those standards to, you're going to have double standards, one for you, one for him. And the ones, the standards that you use for that guy, you're going to judge that guy by those standards. And this is where we get careful. Uh, Nathan says, if you judge Mr. King David, um, you will be likewise judged. So if you judge according to standards that you have, um, well, I don't care if you have multiple standards, but whatever standards you're going to use to judge someone else, you're going to be judged by those very standards. You don't get to use one set of standards for other people and then a different one for yourself, which is very interesting because it raises the whole question of, oh, uh, or is there like a universal standard? It certainly suggests it. It doesn't, uh, it's not a direct inference, but it's like, yeah, well, if the people in power are going to judge and they use standards, then they too can be judged by those standards. So you would think, hey, we've got the origins of a notion of a, of a kind of universal, right? We don't have, nobody gets particular standards or whatever. So the standards for one seem to be su being suggested here that the standards for all. So judge, yeah, go ahead and judge, but remember, you're going to be judged by those standards. Um, and Jesus is going to pick up on that, although he'll give it a little twist, as Jesus liked to do. Um, but that raises, uh, uh, you know, certainly the notion of standards and judging uh, with the hypocrite. And Jesus is big on, you know, about standards and judging. Okay, about, you know, being without sin, and then you can throw the stones and things like that. Um, so that's in, in part of, uh, in, in 2 Samuel 12, uh, 1 to 9. So you can check that out, read the whole thing. It's a very rich and interesting, but it, and a little story to uh, to think about. In, in Job, there, it, it, you know, there is this sort of dichotomy picked up that we saw in, in the previous video with the Greeks, you know, uh, that the hypocrite is godless in heart, right? That uh, now you can read that as just simply a straightforward atheism, but it might be devoid of morality or whatever, however you want to read that. But again, it's picking up on this uh, uh, kind of a dichotomy. Um, anyway, so there's more stuff in the in the Old Testament you can check out, but that's a little bit of a, a beginning. Uh, and again, these ideas will will come back in the New Testament. I want to just finish this video with a little uh, other piece uh, that's relevant to our story of the development of the concept of hypocrisy, especially in the Bible. In the Old Testament, there is a, a big fear. This was common in the ancient world um, and in, in, in Greece. Um, the danger of the uh, uh, of the dead, and um, what is that? Well, in Leviticus, uh, Leviticus twenty one eleven, um, you got to be careful about about getting near a, a, a dead body, um, a dead human body, um, because you could be contaminated by it, right? So there was a fear of this, right? So when people died, you know, you didn't want them around, and no doubt it's connected to uh, physical corruptions and things like that. But they thought there was something really dangerous, morally dangerous, uh, uh, about all this. And it, so in Leviticus, you, you know, you can find there's a notion of contamination, beware of a dead body. Um, numbers uh, 6, uh, uh, verse 6 here, uh, even your parents, like, you know, don't, don't go near them if they pass away. That's sad and all that, but, you know, be careful of the dead body. And it gets even stronger is that in, in 19, Numbers 19, um, if you touch a dead body and you're contaminated and then you go touch up, you can move this contamination around so it can be spread like a virus, right? They didn't have concepts of virus, but they had the notion of spread. Right. And something bad that can be spread through a community. Um, now, so keep that in mind, because Jesus is going to use this kind of idea here, not necessarily in the in the direct way, but he's going to take it up and put it in one of his uh, statements. And he's going to combine it with this. So it's not surprising of a culture that was deeply afraid of dead bodies and their cultural practice wasn't they didn't really have except for important figures. Average figures didn't really have clearly marked graves all the time. So uh, the practice of having clearly marked graves for, for common folk and having graveyards and things like that 
um, that has a historical origin, right? And in some of the times here in this society, um, they didn't really have that for ordinary people. And sometimes there would be, you know, just along a country road, there might be an outcrop of, of rock or something and people would, you know, hide a, a, a body in there. And um, so it was possible, at least in principle, to stumble upon a dead body. Well, that's not a good idea given all this, right? So there was a practice. And as far as I know, it's not directly mentioned. Jesus mentions it in the New Testament. I don't think it's directly mentioned in the Old Testament, but I could be wrong about that. But there was a practice at the time in order to avoid spreading and all this stuff about contamination. There was a practice of whitewashing tombs. So they would go and make sure the tombs were, uh, you know, if there was a dead body and there were rocks in front, they would whitewash the rocks. So it would be like, that's a warning. Stay away uh, because you could be contaminated uh, if you happen to stumble upon and touch uh, a decaying and dead body. All right, so we'll find that uh, uh, Jesus uh, 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 picks up on all these ideas in the New Testament when he is encountering the Pharisees and giving uh, people advice about not to be a hypocrite. All right, so we'll, we'll tackle that when we turn uh, from the Old to the New Testament. See you next video.